Hello, everyone, and welcome to SCORE Fairfield County live webinar on buying a franchise. Is it right for you? I'm Bob Hogan, the webinar coordinator today and a business mentor here at SCORE Fairfield County, and I'm going to be your host. Our presenter today is Cliff Enico, and more on Cliff on just a yeah, minute, in just, just a minute. minute. But, but uh, first, first some brief information, information on uh, SCORE. Uh, SCORE is a national organization with uh, over 300 chapters across the country and 11,000 volunteers. We are a part of the Small Business Administration, the SBA of the federal government. And uh, right here locally in Fairfield County, we have uh, over 140 volunteers with a wide range of industry process and subject matter expertise uh, to help small businesses. And in that regard, we offer three primary services. Um, the first being free one-on-one -on -one, uh, counseling that can, you can get from face-to-face, -face, telephone, email, or video. And you can access that one-on-one uh, -on -one counseling by requesting a mentor link on our website at fairfieldcounty.score.org. We also have a, an extensive education program and we offer roughly 150 workshops and webinars throughout the year for small businesses. And we lastly offer extensive webs, um, resources on our website, um, including access to subject matter experts there. Um, our next uh, webinar will be two weeks from today on January 21st at 12 noon. And the topic is social media marketing on a shoestring. And that'll be Dory DiCarlo presenting. And you can find more specifics again on our website at fairfieldcounty.score.org. Uh, we have set aside time for questions today. And uh, Cliff will take those at the end of the uh, presentation. Uh, to submit a question, please use the chat feature. And you can see that it's at the bottom of your screen and you can um, click on that chat feature and you could submit your questions at any time during the presentation as they come to you and again cliff will uh, take them at the uh, at the end of our time today uh, but we will end our webinar sh uh, sharply at one o'clock to respect your time the session is being recorded and you will have access to the <clears throat> recording link and the materials within the next uh, 24 to 48 hours they'll be up on our website at fairfieldcounty.score.org. It's now my pleasure to introduce our speaker, uh, Cliff Enico. Cliff is a nationally recognized small business legal and tax expert, and is best known as the former host of Money Hunt, where entrepreneurs defended their business plans before America's toughest panel of experts. An attorney and small business consultant here in Fairfield, Connecticut, he has helped launch over 15,000 businesses. He is the author of 16 books, most recently, The Crowdfunding Handbook, how to raise capital for your business using equity funding portals. I'll now turn it over to Cliff. Cliff, it's all yours. Okay, Bob, thank you very much. And thank you to all of you who are taking time out of your busy day and recovering from your New Year's revels here to listen to a, a lawyer yammer on about uh, a topic that's actually very, very close to my heart. Um, I do a lot of work in this space. Uh, in any given year, I probably help 30 to 40 people buy franchises. Uh, I also help people franchise their businesses. At any given time, I'm working with somebody who's looking to, uh, to take their business and uh, make it and turn it into a franchise. And we're going to be spending a little time talking about both sides of this equation. But first of all, the, the usual, um, the usual um, disclaimers, uh, the usual disclaimers, um, you know, first of all, while I do speak for the SCORE uh, organization, um, I do speak for the SCORE organization quite a bit, actually, but I am myself not in any way uh, officially affiliated with the SCORE organization. Um, but more importantly is the second one, that while we will get into some legal and tax stuff in this presentation, um, in, you really can't rely on anything I say here as legal and tax advice. There's a big difference between saying, here's what the law is all about, and here's what you should do, uh, Bob, and here's, Elliot, why you should do something different. Yeah, that's one-on-one -on -one advice. So if anything I say here sounds like a good idea, and you do it, and it doesn't work out, and your business fails, and you end up in bankruptcy, and your spouse divorces you, and your dog pees on your leg, your kids don't want to talk to you, and you're living in a diaper box under the Brooklyn Bridge, you can't really sue anybody, okay? That, that's just that's just a thing. So that's getting all the legal stuff out of the way. Now, what is a franchise? Well, a lot of people think 
that a franchise is like a legal entity, like a corporation or an LLC, like a separate kind of entity, and it's not. Uh, a franchise is simply a contract uh, between two companies, a big one and a small one. The big one we call a franchisor. This is the company that is, if you will, licensing its business model, its program to people. And then we have a franchisee. That's you. Uh, that's the little company. Uh, this is an individual or a family that agrees to run the business in a specific territory using the franchisor's trademarks and business models. So think about it. The best way to think about a franchise is it's exactly halfway between running your own business and working for someone else. It's smack dab in the middle of these two concepts. You, you are an entrepreneur when you buy a franchise. You have your own territory. You have profit and loss responsibility. Uh, virtually all franchise agreements have a clause that says that, you know, as long as you behave and you do things right, the franchise will not put any other uh, franchise into your territory. So you, you own that territory to a certain extent. But it's not your business. It's somebody else's business model that you are executing within that territory. Uh, most franchises have detailed operating rules and procedures, and you must follow them. You cannot opt out of these. Um, when you want to change something, let's say that you know you have a, a haircutting franchise, a, a barber franchise, and you get the idea, hey, if I were to put a TV set in the lobby, uh, the kids could watch cartoons on Saturday morning, I could double my business on Saturdays. Uh, if it's your own business, if it's just your own hair salon, you can do it. Just buy a TV, install it, and off you go. With a franchise, you have to ask permission. And very often, the franchise will not give you permission not because they think it's a bad idea. They may actually love the idea. They may think it's terrific. But at the end of the day, franchises are all about uniformity and consistency. They want all of their units looking the same. And if what you're planning to do is going to make you look different, they're going to say, mm, okay, great idea, Cliff, uh, but let's wait for a while. We may include this as part of our upgrade package down the road, but for now, just keep following the, the model the way, the way we have it. You know, pat, pat on the head, and that's it. Thank you for the idea, by the way. Um, last but not least, when the franchise changes its model, you must go along with the changes, and you have to do this usually at your own expense. So many of you remember uh, a couple of years ago, McDonald's uh, decided to do breakfast all day, 24 seven breakfast. If you were a McDonald's franchisee, you had to make that change. And a lot of McDonald's, I actually represent a couple of McDonald's franchisees, and they complained like hell. Uh, they said, well, wait a minute, we have, we have to train our evening uh, employees to make scrambled eggs. Believe it or not, there are people in this world that do not know how to make scrambled eggs and breakfast sausages. We have to train our, you have to add new equipment. We have to train our evening people. This is going to cost us like thirty, forty thousand dollars to to upgrade to this. And we're not guaranteed any, you know, additional revenue out of all this. You know, what are we going to get in return for all this? You know, uh, you know, McDonald's corporate, what are we going to get out of this? Uh, not everybody went along happily. Now, of course, looking back with hindsight, it was probably one of the smartest things that McDonald's McDonald's franchise ever did. But at the time, you know, the franchisees were not happy. Uh, they, they didn't like this because they were being asked to spend a lot more money. When you buy a franchise, it's, it's exactly halfway between running your own business and working for someone else. It's not your business plan. If you want to make changes, uh, if you want to do things differently, you've got to get permission and you've got to color within the lines, you know, which for some people is very difficult. I see people all the time who I think are too entrepreneurial for a franchise. Um, let's talk about, about that a little bit. What's the difference between being a franchisee and running a standalone business? Well, the advantages of buying a franchise, uh, a friend of mine who's in the franchise industry refers to it as when you buy a franchise, what you're buying are three S's, safety, security, and support. Uh, franchises are perceived as less risky than standalone businesses. And there is some, some data that supports this. Um, there is some published data that say that franchises fail much less frequently than standalone small businesses. So if you are a downsized corporate executive, you have a $100,000 uh, 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 
a termination fee uh, that you, 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 that you want to invest and you want to invest it in something that's going to be profitable. Um, buying a franchise is a lot less risky than, than operating a, a similar standalone business that's not franchise. Although the gap is shrinking now with, 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 because a lot of franchises now are what we call early stage franchises. I'm going to talk about that in a minute. Um, that gap is shrinking. Uh, keep in mind that when we say franchises fail much less frequently, we are not saying that they succeed more frequently. Those are two very different things. Uh, when you're looking to buy a franchise, you're hedging your downside bet. That's what you're doing. Uh, it's not just about fast food anymore. Uh, actually, the fastest growing sector of franchising is service businesses. Uh, there's actually a franchise for consultants, uh, business consultants, like what SCORE does. Uh, there's actually a legal franchise. Uh, they do le basic legal paperwork for things like, you know, LLCs and simple wills and stuff like that. Uh, and just about any, there are franchises in just about any for any basic retail or service business that you can think of, there's probably at least one franchise. Uh, when you buy a franchise, you're, 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 you're buying into a team. You are supported by the franchise system um, as a team. Your neighboring franchisees are not your competitors. Uh, let's say you get sick or something, you come down with ammonia or something, you can call your neighboring franchisee, the one in the town next door, and have them, and they will lend you one of their employees to work your store until you get better, and you'll work out how that person is complicated between you. They, uh, a franchise expects, I always tell people that buying a friend to a franchise is like joining a street gang that makes money. Uh, remember the Jet song from, from West Side Story, you know, when you're a jet and the crap hits the fan, you've got brothers around, you're a family man. That's kind of how it is with the franchise. You know, they, you know, you, you, they expect the franchisees to kind of support each other. Uh, and that's a good thing. Um, you know, and usually the franchise term is limited. It's not forever. Um, the franchise agreement, the vast majority of them are usually five to 10 year terms. So it tends to be somewhat attractive to downside executives in their 40s and 50s who want like a, a bridge to retirement. They're in their 50s. They're not ready to retire yet. They buy a franchise, they run it for 10 years, and then they sell it to, to somebody else. Uh, a lot of, you know, downsize executives look at franchising as a bridge to retirement. So those are the sort of the advantages. There are disadvantages of buying a franchise. Keep in mind that trade-off. When you buy a franchise, you're getting safety and security and support, but you pay a very large price for that. What you pay is your freedom. You don't have the ability to run the business your way. Remember my little example with the haircutting franchise. You want to put a TV set in. If it doesn't fit the franchise model, they won't let you do it. You have to kind of color within the lines. There are usually large upfront and ongoing costs. The typical franchise fee, well, it can be anywhere from $20,000 to $200,000. Uh, that's just for, the, for your territory. Then you have the build-out costs of, uh, of, of setting up the franchise. We'll talk more about that in a minute. Um, you know, you can probably spend a couple upwards of $100,000 to $200,000 to launch a franchise business the right way. Um, a lot of people buy franchises in the hopes that they will be an absentee owner someday, that they will not have to be the person who goes in and, you know, makes the smoothies or does whatever, flips the hamburgers or does whatever, but there's no guarantee that will happen. I have had a couple of situations in my career where some of my franchisees' clients were called away from cruise ships in the Caribbean. They actually had to helicopter back to, back to land because their manager you know, of the franchise got sick or had a skiing accident or something like that, and nobody else knew how to run the thing. So you know, that does happen sometimes, uh, you know, at least you know, for a while. There's also no guarantee the franchise model will be viable over the long term. Uh, franchises are subject to economic disruption just like any other business is. 15 years ago, uh, two of the hottest franchises were check cashing stores, um, you know, which now you hardly see because the government started regulating payday loans. Uh, and there was another one too, it's actually a very popular franchise. Uh, what they did was they refilled your toner cartridges in your printers. So if you had a lot of printers, if you were a small business that had a lot of like computer printers, you could bring your cartridges there. And it, how many people here print out documents anymore? Now everything's digital, everything's PDF, you know, so that was the end of that franchise. Uh, franchisers are subject to the uh, obsolescence, the same as any standalone business are. Here is Cliff Enico's rule. This is the 
the, I call it the franchise catch 22. And I'm happy to take responsibility for this because there are, I have a lot of friends in the franchise industry that would hate me to say this, but, but I think it's it, it, in the interest of working with score clients, I have to be very blunt about this. As a franchise becomes more established and successful and perfects its business model, the franchise becomes much less affordable and is more, much less likely to be flexible in enforcing its rules, regulations, and requirements. The bigger they get, the more expensive they get, and the more rigid they get. Uh, too often, the only franchise you can afford is one that is just getting off the ground and hasn't gotten its act together and cannot give you the assurances that a more established franchise would. If you want to talk to Burger King right now, they can tell you exactly what your operating data is going to be for the first 6, 12, 18 months that you start out. They can tell you to the penny what that is going to be. So how much does this franchise cost? Well, they want a quarter of a million dollars just to talk to you. To even get in and talk to Burger King about a new territory, you have to be willing to put up to, to fork over $250,000 with no guarantee you will actually get a franchise. That is how rigid and expensive that, they, uh, that is. And yet Burger King is a very successful franchise. No one's questioning that. The more successful, the more expensive, and the more rigid. Okay, that's the catch-22 of franchising. The only franchises you can afford sometimes are the ones that haven't gotten their act together and where you're taking more of a business risk. Okay, so let's talk about early stage franchises. This is what most of you are going to be looking at. Uh, a franchise that has less than 50 franchisees. That's just my number. That's not from any published source. You know, um, until a franchise has 50 franchisees in several states, I consider it to be an early stage franchise. Pros are it's more affordable. You're looking perhaps at an upfront fee of 20, 30,000 as opposed to a quarter of a million dollars. Uh, they usually will give you more run, room to run. You know, their franchise model hasn't quite gelled yet. So especially if you are their first franchisee in a new state, they'll kind of give you room to run because they figure you and your local attorney will know the local rules and regulations better than they do. And they'll stay out of your hair a bit and they'll see how you do. You will be their guinea pig. Um, you know, they are also are more willing to negotiate their franchise terms. Uh, whenever I'm working with a client who's buying into an early stage franchise, I tend to be a bit more aggressive in representing this client than I would if they're talking to a more established client because I, you know, if, if I don't ask, I'm not going to get. And very often the franchises will be flexible because they want this new franchisee. Every new franchisee is important to them. So they're, they'll, they'll be willing to bend the rules a little bit to, to give them what they want. Um, but there are disadvantages to an early stage franchise. Management may not be able to provide enough support. Beware the franchise that is growing exponentially. Beware the franchise that's adding 30, 40 new franchisees a year, and they've only got three people in their management team. I see this a lot in early stage franchises. I mean, it's great that they're successful, but you know, do they have enough time to provide all the support that you need, especially during those first couple of critical years when you're freaking out, you don't know what you're doing, you're calling their toll-free hotline at three in the morning on a Sunday and you expect to get an answer. Um, you know, beware of this. They may not be able to provide you with the support that you need. You may be a pioneer or a guinea pig for the franchise. You know, if you're the first franchisee in a particular state, we really don't know, and nobody knows how this franchise is going to perform in that state. The franchisor doesn't know, you don't know, I as your attorney don't know. We're all taking a giant leap of faith here. Um, and you may not have the entrepreneurial spirit to, to take those kinds of leaps of faith. Again, people who buy franchises tend not to be extremely entrepreneurial. There's one exception to that. Um, you may need to be more entrepreneurial than you wish to be. Let's say you are very entrepreneurial. Let's say you're the kind of person, kind of like I am, where if you give me something, you know, you throw something in my lap, I can think within a few minutes, I can think of 10 ways to make it better. I'm just one of those people, you know, and, and a lot of you on this in the audience are like this as well. An early stage franchise may be a good fit for you. What I, some, what I would recommend when I see somebody who's really entrepreneurial uh, buying a franchise, what I'll recommend is why don't you buy the whole state? You know, instead of just buying one little territory with five zip codes, why don't you make an offer to become like their master franchisee 
for the state of Connecticut. Take the whole state. That's where you buy the whole state, and then you find the moms and pops will run the individual territories. You're like the franchisor's agent in that state, because that's how people get rich in franchising. If your goal is truly to get rich in franchising and become a millionaire or, or more, the, you really don't do it with one or two restaurants. You can't really do it with one or two little local territories. The way you get rich in franchising is to buy a whole state, become a master franchisee, and each time you sell a new franchise, you get a piece of their royalty payments each month. That's how the, the big you know, McDonald's and Burger King franchisees became rich. Um, if you're really entrepreneurial, that's the way to play an early stage franchise rather than just buying one or two little local territories. Okay, so now let's get into the practical stuff. Where do you find franchise opportunities? Well, there's three, thing, there's three ways to do it. The least effective way is an online search. So pick the business you want and then search for dry cleaning franchise, search for consulting franchise or business consulting franchise, search for smoothie fran franchise, search for yogurt franchise. I get calls every day from people who say, hey, I found this great franchise on the internet. Okay, just keep in mind that a lot of these franchises are not ready for prime time. You know, we're not just talking early stage here, we're talking about a franchise that has been formed where you know, there are no operating units. Some guys had a bright idea, they put together an FTD and they threw it out there. Uh, a lot of these are not ready for prime time. Be careful when you, with franchises that you, that, you, that you surface on the internet. There are some franchise directories on the internet, um, mostly for the larger franchises, uh, but Franchise Direct is actually a pretty good website. They actually, uh, I see a lot of early stage franchises listed on that directory. Uh, the SBA does have a franchise directory. Uh, this is everybody. Uh, this is every franchise that they are aware of that exists in the United States. Um, I mean, it, it can be a little bit overkill. There's probably too much information in the SBA directory, but at least you know you're seeing everything that's out there. <clears throat> and then uh, Entrepreneur Magazine has always been very big in the franchise space. Each year they publish a franchise 500 uh, with the leading franchises in each category. Um, you won't find the little ones there. You won't find the early stage ones there. Uh, but you will find all the, if you want to know who the leading yogurt franchises are, they, they will be in the Entrepreneur Franchise 500. Last but not least, and this is probably the most effective way uh, to buy a franchise, uh, there are franchise brokers out there. There are people like business brokers uh, whose, whose mission is to help match you with a franchise that is the best fit for you. Um, there are two major organizations of franchise brokers. There's FranNet, which is the franchise network. There's also an organization called FranChoice.com. Uh, what they give you is one-on-one -on -one assistance. They actually sit down with you, they do some analysis, they do some you know, interest uh, testing. If any of you who ever have had taken an interest inventory in your life, uh, psychological profiling, they'll do this with you, and they'll try to find the franchise that's a good fit for you. So for example, I am one of those people who hates getting their hands dirty. I, I just don't like it. I'm one of those people, I've always got a hand sanitizer somewhere within reach of me. I mean, forgive me, I'm just one of those kind of people. So an automotive franchise where you're getting under people's cars and getting covered in grease and oil, that's just not going to work for me. I love cars, but I just, it's just not right for me because I'm not the one who's going to be able to get under there and do it. Uh, I mean, that's just me, okay? Um, you know, you got to find out what's a fit for you. If you do not like the idea of getting paper cuts, do not buy a UPS store franchise. I mean, that sounds silly, but you're going to be spending a lot of your day packing boxes and stuff like that, and you're going to get paper cuts. I mean, it's just, you know, this is what a franchise broker will do, will help you sort of work through a lot of the psychological issues of buying a franchise. And another advantage of buying through franchise brokers is that they don't work with all franchises. The franchises that they work with tend to be, at least the two large groups, FriendNet and FranChoice, um, they, uh, they, they work with franchises that have at least to some extent been vetted. They're not gonna work with the franchise that's just getting started and hasn't gotten its first franchisee yet. They'll work, be working with franchises that have at least 10, 15, 20 in different states and different kinds of environments. Uh, and that are at least somewhat more, that, that seem to be growing, that seem to be building their business models. There's a little bit more assurance that the franchise you're getting, that you're buying, is not going to you know, crash and burn within five years. 
uh, when you go through a broker. It's less likely to happen. Uh, there are some disadvantages though. Uh, brokers, you usually do not pay the broker a fee. Uh, like a real estate broker, the broker only gets a piece of your upfront fee if you buy a franchise through them. If you buy a franchise through them, they get a fee. It can be anywhere from 20 to 50% of your upfront franchise fee. Uh, for that. So a lot of them are, are, are pushy. I mean, they will try to push you into making a decision. Uh, I, I think I can say that pretty, uh, you know, pretty right. Some more, some less, it depends on the individual, but that because their success depends on you buying a franchise, if they see that you're waffling a little bit, they may be more inclined to give you a hard sell uh, than certainly, you know, an attorney or somebody else would. So those are the kind of the pros and the cons. Um, you know, when you go to these websites, you, you type in your zip code to find the franchise broker nearest you. So how do you choose the right franchise for you? Well, do you think you will enjoy the day-to-day -day work? Like I said earlier, a lot of people go into franchising thinking that they're going to be an absentee owner, but you can't count on that. If you don't like packing boxes, do not buy a UPS store franchise. If you, know, if, if you hate cars, if a car is just something, if you're like me, driving a 1995 Toyota Camry with 180,000 miles on it, if cars are not really your thing, you're not really into them, do not buy an automotive repair franchise. I mean, it is, I mean a lot of it's just common sense. Do you believe in the franchise? franchises, products, and services, especially in an early stage franchise. A lot of these franchises have products and services that people have not heard of before. You may need to be an evangelist. You know, if, if you buy a Burger King, if I'm driving down a, a commercial strip in some town in the Midwest and I see a Burger King sign, I know exactly what I'm going to get, what the menu is, what the experience is, how the, the uniforms of the employees were. I know what I'm getting. If I'm driving down a, a commercial strip though, and I see a franchise uh, a sign for Butterfly Life. Butterfly Life, that's an actual franchise, believe it or not. Um, it, it's not very big in the Northeast, but uh, there, are some, there are some units out in the Midwest. What would you think Butterfly Life is? What does it look like? You know, if it were me, of course, I always said to default to, to, default to food. It kind of has like an Asian vibe to it. So I'm thinking it's probably like an Asian restaurant or something like that, but it isn't. Uh, Butterfly Life is a franchise of women's only gyms. Uh, they compete with curves, right? Well, okay, that's all interesting. And you may be interested in that as a business model, but the name is not going to help you. That's my, my point here. You can't sit, the people that do not do well in franchising are the people who sit back and let the franchise name do all the work. Uh, with an early stage franchise, that's not going to happen. You cannot rely on the franchise name to do the work for you. You're the one who has to be the evangelist who builds the, the brand awareness for that franchise in your territory. Will the franchise give you a decent living within the first year to two years of operations? The most important number when you're looking at franchise numbers, what is the owner's discretionary income? We call this ODI. In plain English, how much are the owners taking out to live on? After picking all the monthly expenses, the rent, the payroll, everything else, the franchise fees, the monthly royalty payments that you have to pay, are they making a decent living? If it's gonna take you more than two to three years to get to a point where you're making a living wage, maybe this isn't a franchise for you. You really wanna see what other franchisees are doing. And the most important question you can ask them is how long did it take you to break even? How long did it take you to reach a decent ODI? Are you satisfied with the ODI that you're getting? Are you comfortable with the territory that you're buying? Uh, rule number one, never buy a franchise where the territory is more than a 20 minute drive from where you live. That's one of my basic rules. If you don't know the community very well that you're buying, it's gonna be very hard for you to build that brand awareness within the territory. And the most important thing is, do you buy the franchise's people? When you buy a franchise, you are buying the people. You are buying the management team. You are also buying uh, the current franchisees. Do you like these people? Do you identify with these people? Do you see yourself as one of them? That is very, very important. If you don't buy the people, do not buy the franchise. That's one of Cliff Enico's basic rules. Here are some things to watch out for. Watch out for the flyover country franchise. There are many franchises that work extremely well in the, the the heartland in the south southern parts of the country what we consider flyover country they usually get started in a place like iowa they do very well in the midwest and the south but the minute the franchise expands to the two coasts the northeast and the far west the franchise model falls apart 
I see a lot of franchises, for example, that say during the first year of operations, you must hire at least five people uh, at, a th at, at a base salary of at least $30,000 per year pre-tax. Well, forgive me, I live in Connecticut. You cannot live in Connecticut on $30,000 pre-tax. Finding those people is going to be very, very difficult. I don't know where you're going to find them. Maybe in Iowa, Montana, they have those people, but you're not going to find them in Connecticut. So just be careful. There are a lot of franchises that work well in some parts of the country that don't work everywhere. The single product line franchise. We have a manufacturing business. We make widgets, and we're going to set up a franchise to act as a distribution network for our widgets. And we don't want anybody, uh, anybody else's widgets being used in this franchise. This is a distribute. There are franchises like that that are formed primarily uh, for the purpose of selling a single line of products. Be careful. They may not be the best products in the world. You know, there may be a reason why they're not in Home Depot or, you know, Lowe's or someplace like that. You know, watch out for the franchise that's partying like it's 1999. I see a lot of these. Uh, franchises that are still wedded to a brick and mortar model. If a franchise agreement requires you to take out a Yellow Pages ad, run screaming from the room. Uh, this is a franchise that is not keeping up with the time. If you ask who their social media marketing director is and their answer is, what's that? Or here's Aunt Irma, she's 80 years old and she's gonna handle our Facebook page run screaming from the room. Now, seriously, I make a joke of it, but it really is true. There are a lot of, of, of franchises that aren't adapting to a digital world. That's a question you have to ask. The low margin franchise that won't give you a decent living until you own at least three outlets, you should be able to make a decent ODI with only one outlet if you're buying a franchise. There are franchises, actually some very popular and some famous franchises that are not like this. They're franchises that have very high operating costs. You barely break even with the first unit, but if you own five of them, you're okay. Uh, watch out for those. Uh, there are some actually some very good franchises out there though that people don't realize you can't really make a decent ODI on, on just one unit. Um, you know, I mean, seriously, you, you know, and you know, you know where they are. If you go into a franchise outlet and there's only one employee who's trying to make like 50 sandwiches, you know, during a lunch break. That's how you spot that kind of franchise. Um, you know, be very careful. If the, if the one employee looks, who's also, by the way, the owner, looks like he's working 90 hours a week for $30,000 a year, run screaming from the room. Uh, the franchise is that promises you will be a manager, not a worker. No franchise can ever make that promise. Uh, so be careful. Oh, don't worry, you'll be a management owner. Somebody else will make the smoothies every day run screaming from the room. Uh, last but not least, the franchise that's owned by a private equity firm. This is a little bias of mine. There are private equity firms that go and buy up a lot of smaller franchises. Uh, be very careful. Private equity firms are not long-term investors. They want to see a return on their investment in three, five, seven years normally when they buy a company. Uh, you may not be looking, they may be looking at an ownership change sometime during your franchise agreement term and you want to try to avoid that wherever possible. Okay, sizing up the, pro the, pro the franchise, here's some of the things you have to consider. Do the demographics support the franchise model? If this is an upscale uh, product line of product or services and your franchise territory uh, is mostly in an inner city, I would be very worried about that, uh, to be honest with you. The franchise territory should match what the franchise model is doing. Um, most franchise territories will have, I mean, do the, will have good demographics, but there'll also be some areas of your territory that don't have good demographics. Try to negotiate the zip codes so that at least most of your territory has a demographic profile that fits the franchise model. Is the competition manageable? Here in Connecticut, we do not regulate senior caregivers. Uh, just about anybody can call themselves a senior caregiver um, you know, without having to go through any kind of licensing or any kind of complicated, you know, uh, like examination procedure. I mean, I could go out tomorrow and call myself a companion caregiver and no one will ever say boo. Uh, there are some states that heavily regulate uh, senior caregivers. New York is a very good example. Uh, you have to pass certain exams. You have to be, I think, at least an LPN, a licensed practical nurse, before you can hold yourself out. But some states don't care because we don't care virtually every senior care franchise has outlets in Connecticut. Uh, 
Uh, and if anybody's planning to open up a new senior care franchise in Connecticut, I would be very nervous about that because the competition is simply too fierce. You'll be tripping over your competition. You know, is the competition manageable uh, when you look at your territory? Is it big enough to give you room to grow? Can you expand? Um, if not, can you get a right of first refusal? Some franchises will do this. If they don't have franchises in, in neighboring territories, if they're just expanding into a state, they may um, give you a right of first refusal over adjoining territories. Um, are you hemmed in by other franchisees? You know, is there, are, are you surrounded by other franchisees such that you will never be, have more than one unit? You know, if you're looking to build an empire, if you're looking to grow, or especially if you have one of those franchises where you have to have three or four units before you get a decent ODI, you, you, that's not a good scenario for you. Are rents affordable? You know, here in Southern Connecticut on the Gold Coast here, just north of New York City, it's not uncommon to see you know, a retail space going for 80 to $90 a square foot. If you're doing a smoothie franchise, that's an awful lot of smoothies you have to sell each month to cover your monthly nut. Do some basic break-even analysis and ask, is the commute going to kill you? you know, never buy a franchise that's more than a 20-mile drive from your home. I, I'm a big believer in that. Uh, you know, don't fall into the trap. If you live in, say, Stanford, Connecticut, and a, a territory comes up in Hartford, you're going to be moving up to Hartford and living there. Make sure, also make sure you know the community. It's very hard to succeed in a franchise where you, you're not a part of the community. Last night, it, bottom line, it's difficult to succeed in, in a, in succeed in a franchise territory you do not know well. You know, get something that's close to home where you're part of the community. Um, if you are buying a tutoring franchise where you tutor ki people's kids after school, um, you um, and you're and you're in a community where you yourself don't have kids in the school system, you don't know the local teachers who are going to refer you to the tutor. You're going to have a tough time building that brand. Okay. Steps in buying, here's the steps in buying a franchise. Number one, understand the franchise fees and costs. Do some number crunching. When's that ODI going to be happening? Number two, you attend the franchise's discovery day. Every franchise does this. It's usually once a month. They'll invite you out to corporate headquarters. You'll meet and greet. You'll shake hands with the management team. This is where you get to meet the management team, ask some basic questions. It's kind of a sales meeting. They may put you in a bus and drive you to a local unit you know, that's obviously operating very well. They're not going to send you to, an, to a unit that's failing. Uh, it'll, be, it'll be like their model unit or whatever, and you'll get to ask questions of the people flipping the burgers, and they all look like they're all happy and they're wonderful. Of course, they're getting paid for that. Um, I, I'm, I'm, a little, I'm a little cynical about discovery days, okay? But it's part of the process. Then, the, and number three is the most important, interview as many current franchisees as possible. If there are 30 franchisees, call every one of them. Don't just call the one or two that are closest. Don't be afraid to ask the same questions over and over again. It may be that 19th person that you talk to that says something a little different than the other 18, and that will trigger some things in your mind. Call as many as possible. Um, and be sure to include, if, they have, if there are franchisees who have left the system within the last three years, they are required to disclose that to you. Talk to those people. What went wrong? Why didn't it work for you? What happened? You know, the, the, I mean, and listen very carefully. Don't just listen to the words. Listen to the music. If people don't sound happy, if they don't sound thrilled about the franchise, that will come across at some point. Hire an attorney to help you review the franchise's FDD, uh, the franchise agreement. Uh, at some point, if you get this far, you talk to their franchisees, at some point, they will send you this document. It's a 200-page legal document. It's a prospectus. It's the same document that you would get if you bought a, a share of, of like Facebook stock in a public offering. Uh, get an attorney to review this for you. If you're like most people, you're not used to reviewing 200-page uh, legal documents. I am. I am in that business. The way I work is I will take those documents, I will tear them apart, I will send you a memo with 50 things that we have to talk about, and we will spend two or three, two or three hours on the phone walking through each one of those points until I feel that you're getting the information that you need to, to make an informed decision about this. It's a very worthwhile process. Um, you know, there are some people who don't go through this because they say, well, the franchisers don't like to negotiate their franchise documents. That is true to some extent, but in most cases, you can get um, what's called either an addendum or a letter of clarification where the franchise will explain in greater detail 
uh, what their program is all about. So for example, uh, 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 an addendum might say something like, in section 9.1 of the franchise agreement where it says we take a lien on your firstborn child, um, we only do that if you are actually in default, and quite frankly, you can take you can pick the kid we take. Pick, the, pick your least favorite kid. We'll take that. Okay. By the way, don't laugh too hard. I, you'd be surprised what's in some of these franchise agreements. There's some pretty onerous provisions in there. But that's what the, what the and it's worth well worth doing it because that would be evidence in a court of law. If you ever, God forbid, got into litigation with the franchise, that would be evidence of what they promised you. Uh, attend then. Once you buy the franchise, once you've signed the FDD and off on the FDD and the franchise agreement, now you're part of the franchise. You have to go through a training program, which is usually a week to two weeks. You fly out to their corporate headquarters and you sit in the classroom and you they, they go through the operations manual, which is usually, you know, about, usually it's a couple of thousand pages. It's like several notebooks full of stuff that you have to commit to memory. Um, and then if it's a brick and mortar franchise, you now have to build the franchise territory. You have to find space, negotiate a lease, and complete your build out per the franchise's specification. Um, let's talk a little bit about the fees and costs. Um, there are three types of fees that you have to pay to a franchise. There's the upfront fee. That's the fee to buy your territory. It's usually non-refundable. It includes the cost of training you. It's usually, again, for an early stage franchise, it'll probably be between twenty and $50,000, and it is non-refundable. If you did go through a franchise broker, the brokerage commission will be paid out of that upfront fee. Then you have a monthly royalty payment. Each month, you have to pay the franchise a percentage of your gross income. In the vast majority of cases, it's between 5 and 12%. I sometimes see franchises, there are rare franchises that have a flat fee that you pay every month. It's usually between two and $5,000, but that's very rare. Mostly it's a percentage of your gross income and that comes off the top. That comes off your gross income, not your net. You are not sharing profit. That payment goes to the franchise before you pay the rent, before you pay payroll, before you pay anything else. The third thing is the advertising fund contribution. Most franchises have a national advertising fund that goes out and buys advertising and media for all the franchises nationwide. That's usually an additional 1% to 2% of your gross income each month that you pay. Uh, although there's no guarantee they will use advertising funds to advertise within your territory. Then there are often additional fees. Item seven of the FDD, uh, there are 23 items in, uh, in an FDD, and item seven is a detailed summary of all the expenses and fees that they charge and that you will have to pay. Always get a reality check on this. Don't ever assume that the franchise, that the summary in item seven is accurate. Uh, your, your fees may differ. Always get reality checks. The good news is it's a good list of all the things you have to spend money on, but the actual estimates may be off. Uh, especially if you are the first franchisee in the Northeast or the West Coast, chances are your cost of operations are gonna be significantly greater than what's in item seven. So do a reality check. Um, costs, always do a reality check, especially if it's a brick and mortar franchise. Okay, now I'm gonna race through this a little bit because I'm gonna give you something here. Those of you who have been kind enough to listen to me so far, here are some of the questions you should ask, especially when you're interviewing other franchisees. Remember, this is the most important part of the process, is talking to other franchisees and getting the, the reality check of what, they're, what, what it's like to be in this franchise. How long did it take you to start the business and land your first customer? How long did it take you to generate revenue? How long did it take to find a suitable location and negotiate a lease? Were you able to find quality employees who were willing to work within your budget? Which marketing methods recommended by the franchise work, which didn't work? Okay. How long did it take you to break even? Did you incur any significant costs that were not listed in item seven? Were there any surprise expenses? that we're not in item seven. What is your current ODI? Do not be afraid to ask them. How much are they taking out of the franchise each month? Can you live on that? Is the franchise management team's responsive? What is your actual budget for local marketing and advertising? Most franchises, in addition to your contribution to the National Advertising Fund, they will want you to spend about one to 2% of gross sales each month on local advertising. Is that enough? Does it work? Do you have to take out TV ads for this franchise to survive? If so, it's gonna be a lot more than one to 2% of gross income if you have to do video production. Is the franchisor's pricing of its products and services competitive? Are people willing to pay $6 for a smoothie in your town? You know, a lot of them are not. Um, do you receive any benefit from the franchise's marketing fund? 
Do, do, are, are they actually taking out advertising or buying media in your, in your state, in your territory? You don't want to be spending 1% to 2% of your gross sales each month so that the California franchisees can have a ball. You know, that's not the point. If you're in New York, of course, if you're in California, that's terrific. Um, you want to see, you know, that at least some of the marketing fund is going to your, to at least your region, if not your territory. What was your biggest challenge in starting the franchise business? What was the biggest surprise you had? Are you happy with the amount of time you are spending in running the business? The person keeps falling asleep during the phone call. That is not a good sign. Okay, they're, they're obviously working 90 hours a week. If you, and the most important, if you had to do it all over again, would you buy this franchise? Now, I know I kind of raced through that, but if you weren't able to write them down, no worries. I have a free download. It's available on my website at cliffenico.com called 25 Questions You Should Ask Before Buying a Franchise. It is free. You are not signing up for anything. I do not sell your data um, or of any kind. Go to cliffenico.com, click on the resources tab, and it's unfortunately I have to update the page. It's called if you, the link is ten questions you should ask before buying a franchise, but it's actually twenty five questions. It's a free download, or if you have trouble doing that, send me an email to crnico at gmail.com. I will send you a copy without charge. Okay, all right. So now, okay, so now you have uh, analyzed the costs. You have um, you've talked to other franchisees. Now it's time to actually tear apart the FDD with your franchise attorney. Do not do this alone. Have an attorney help you, okay? These are the most important. There are 23 items in FDD, and these are the most important. Item one, the company history and affiliates. Who owns this franchise? Is there a private equity fund involved in the ownership chain? If that happens, that's kind of a red flag. Um, because you know there's going to be an ownership change sometime during your franchise term. How long has the franchise been in business? Less than five years? Over 20 years? Are the franchise's affiliates also its suppliers? This is how you find the, the franchise that's only meant to sell a single line of products or services. It's really just an affiliate of the, of the product manufacturer. Uh, if 90% if, if of your suppliers are coming from one source, that's why this franchise exists. The management team, item two, uh, read their resumes. Uh, whenever I look at a business plan of any kind, the first thing I look at is the executive summary that talks about what the business is. But the next thing I do is I talk to them, I look at the management team, I look at the, I look at the, at the, at the, at the resumes. Do they have relevant experience? If this is a smoothie franchise, but most of the, of the executives came out of the physical fitness or gym arena, that could be a red flag that they don't really know what they're doing. Um, you know, do they have relevant experience? Um, if this is a service franchise and most of the people come out of the fast food world, that could be a sign that maybe they just don't have the kind of relevant experience. Can they train you to run a, do they have what it takes to train you in running a, a gym business? Are there enough people to serve franchisees? If a franchise is adding 20, 30 franchisees a year and the management team consists of fewer than five people, you are going to have a problem there. They simply cannot spread themselves that thin to give the kind of support for, for 20, 30 new franchisees a year. Also, have they been in their jobs too long? I see a lot of franchises that, have, that are 20 years or older. It's mom and pop, and they've been, they've, they've been the management team for 20 years. Are they getting too long in the tooth? Are they adapting to changes in the world? Are they adapting to a digital world? Is this franchise being ad adapted uh, to, new, to current times, or are they still partying like it's 1999? Okay, litigation, item three. If there is any, th th there should be nothing in item three. If there's any litigation between the franchise and its franchisees, you want to know what happened there. Uh, I will, if I see things in item three, I will ask the franchise to send me the court papers, send me a link to the corporate papers on Westlaw, and I will read them to find out what happened here because I don't want you buying into a franchise that's suing its own franchisees. If that's happening, there's a big red flag there and you wanna find out what's happening there. Item seven, we talked about, that's the summary of expenses. Item 19, and by the way, there is a lot between items three, uh, three and 19, just so you know, but it's mostly summaries of what's in the franchise agreements. So when I do a franchise review, I, I, I read the agreement itself. I don't read the sum, I don't rely on the summary. I read the actual contract language to find out what's going on there. Item 19 is performance statistics. It's not required by the FTC rule. 
Um, the information is usually pretty useless. I have to tell you, I'm not a big fan of item 19. Uh, most fran There's just too many ways that you can fudge it. What most franchises do is they say, well, here's how the top third of our franchisees are performing. Here's how the middle tier is performing. Here's how the bottom tier is performing. And we only look at uh, franchisees that have been around for at least three years. Well, okay, that's all interesting information, but that's not helping you. You want to know, how are the newbies doing? How long is it taking new franchises to get up and running and break even? And item 19 never contains that information. So it's kind of interesting, but you know, read it with a grain of salt. It's no, it's no prediction of what you're gonna do. Item 20 is to me the most important part of the FTD. This, these, are, this, is, these, are, this is the statistics about how the franchise is growing. And there are five tables in item 20. Table number one is the overall franchise growth. How is it growing year over year? The questions you need to ask here, can the franchise's management team handle exponential growth? If growth has slowed in the past three years, you wanna know why. So if 2016 they added 20, 2017 they added 20, 2018 they added four, something happened there. They hit a wall of some kind. What is that, what happened there? Get the story. Table number two, these are the number of franchises that are selling out. 3% um, to 5% turnover a year is acceptable. Anything higher than that, I would ask questions about why that's happening. Table number three, this is the geographic breakdown by state. Where is the franchise's center of gravity? If the center of gravity is in the Midwest or in the South, how are they gonna do in New York? How are they gonna do in California? Okay, how many other franchisees are there in your state, in the region? If there's lots, is there room for more? So if you're in a small state like Rhode Island and they got six franchisees, well, is there room for a seventh? <coughs> I don't really know. If there's few or none, will the franchise give you room to run? This tells me that the franchise doesn't have a lot of experience in your state. You know, will they give you the freedom to adapt to local conditions? Um, table number three, you also wanna look at something. There's a column in table three, franchisees who have ceased operations for other reasons. Um, here is something that I always tell people who are buying into a firm. Well, actually, we'll talk more about this a little bit later. You want to know how many of these were negotiated terminations. How many of these were a situation where the franchise allowed the franchisee to exit? Table number four, company-owned outlets. It's okay for a franchise to have one or two outlets that they run themselves, but too many Gives sends the signal that they are going to be competing too much a little bit with their franchisees. You know, if the company owned outlets are doing better than the franchised outlets, you want to know why and what's going on. Then last but not least is table number five, projected future growth. What is the time lag between a signed agreement and a functioning location? They disclose how many franchisees have signed agreements uh, but haven't opened their stores yet. If there's a significant time lag between those two things, you want to know what that is. Um, hang on a second here. Hang on a second. I just, I clicked a button that I should not have clicked. I, I hate this. Um, okay. So, okay. Where is, okay. Let's talk about exiting the franchise because this is, is fairly important. Um, one of the questions you want to ask is if the franchise doesn't work out, how easy is it to get out of the franchise? Okay, this is why in that table number three, you wanna look at the number of franchisees who have ceased operations for other uh, reasons. Here's the myth. If you read the franchise documents, they franchise take and say, there's really no way you can exit before the franchise term expires. Uh, you have to, the only way that you can get out is by selling your franchise to somebody else, find a greater fool to buy this territory. But the reality is most franchises will let you out as long as number one, you don't ask for your money back. Uh, number two, you agree to release the franchise from any liability. You say that you're not going to sue them. Uh, you agree to be bound, you're, you're gonna to have to be bound by the franchise's uh, non-compete clause, which is usually somewhere between 18 months and two years. Um, and will there be an early termination fee? If you have a 10 year term and you're buying out in year three and you're selling out in year three, will they ask you to pay seven years worth of minimum royalties uh, in order to get out of the franchise? These are the key questions. By looking at that table number three, you can usually figure out how easy it is to get out of the franchise despite what the franchise agreement says, okay? Let's say, 
a lot of people uh, are nervous about buying early stage franchises rather than starting up a new territory if they do have uh, existing franchisees, you may be able to buy an existing franchise outlet that's already set up, so you don't have to go through all the startup costs of getting the business up and running. Um, it's it's it, it, If you do decide to buy an existing franchise, it's a four-step operation. Uh, you First of all, you have to review the franchise's FDD and be approved by the franchise, just like you do with a new, if you're buying a new territory. You have to form an LLC or corporation to run the business. You then have to purchase the assets of the existing franchisee. You don't buy the stock ever because there's... Uh, there's there's legal and tax issues involved in that. You always want to buy the assets, and your franchise attorney hopefully will help you do that. I usually do about ten of these a year, um, you know, myself. If the franchise is brick and mortar, you also have to assume the seller's lease of the franchise location, and that can be very tricky. A lot of landlords do not like it when a good tenant changes hands and gets acquired by somebody else. I have had deals where a, a franchisee was selling to another franchise and the landlord basically killed the deal by asking for an additional three month security deposit by you know, imposing all kinds of credit worthiness checks on the new buyer. Make sure you have a good accountant and a good lawyer. Watch out for landlords, lenders, and other third parties. Last but not least, who's gonna pay the transfer fee? Okay, last thing. I know most of you listening to this program are looking to buy a franchise as a franchisee, but there may be one or two people um, who, are, who have a business who, who they, uh, for which they want to form a franchise. Here's the thing. Do not call me ever and say, hey, Cliff, I've got this wonderful restaurant in nowhere, Connecticut. We're doing great. We're making tons of money. We want to franchise this. Will you help us? Because the answer is going to be no. If you only have one unit, or two units, you are not ready for franchising. If you are thinking about having a franchise, you should have at least five units operating in at least one urban and one ur rural environment for at least three years, preferably in more than one state or part of the country. When you set up a franchise, you are telling pe people, this is replicable. This is, I can take this business model and it will work just as well in Iowa as in Connecticut. It will work as well in a city as in a rural area. And with, with less than five units in operation, you simply cannot make those, those, those representations and warranties. You cannot. So don't think, even think about franchising unless you have five or 10 units in operation, then come and call me and we'll talk because it's not a cheap process. You're going to have to prepare an FDD and franchise agreement that meets the requirements of the FTC. Uh, you then have to register or file your FDD in about 22 states that require you to do so. Your budget should be at least thirty dollars to $50,000 to franchise an existing business. Okay, so wrapping up, here are the key points. Buy, buying a franchise is halfway between running your own business and working for someone else. The more established or successful the franchise, the more expensive and rigid it's going to be. If you don't buy the people, don't buy the franchise. Speak to as many current franchisees as you can. Don't be afraid to ask tough questions. Don't be afraid to ask the same questions 18 times over because that 19th person may just tell you something that the other 18 won't. Hire an attorney to do a thorough review of the franchise's FTD and franchise agreement. Uh, consider uh, there's something called a ROBS you can do to finance your franchise perfect purchase. Ask if you're working with a franchise broker or an attorney, ask about that. It's a way of tapping into a 401k uh, from a prior employee to use the funds to buy a franchise. And then finally, and the most important thing, success in franchising, like any small business, depends on how well you market the franchise concept. Uh, don't rely on the franchise's trademark to do all the work with, for you. Even as a franchisee, you have to be at least somewhat entrepreneurial. So with that, let's open the floor for some questions and answers. Bob? Thanks, Cliff. Uh, we have a couple minutes here for questions, but uh, we don't have a lot. As a reminder, if you want to submit a question, please put it in the chat box. And uh, maybe we'll start with a question um, from Don that's uh, asking, I'm, I'm interested in a franchise that's hugely popular in New York. However, there aren't many in Connecticut. Does this mean they won't work in Connecticut? The short answer is, I don't know. Um, there are a number of things you have to look at. This is where you really want to look at table number three in the, um, 
in the uh, FDD and see where is the center of gravity for this franchise. If the center of gravity is in states like New York, California, and other high income, high cost states, there's a pretty good chance that it will work in Connecticut as well because Connecticut is, is that type of state. Um, there may well be that, um, that Connecticut has regulation that New York doesn't have. Uh, and that's very possible. So for example, if you're doing a senior care franchise, uh, there's virtually no regulation in Connecticut, but there is in New York. There are very few senior care franchises operating in New York. New York has very heavy regulations on what senior care caregivers can and cannot do. So you have to ask the question, why is it? It may well be just that their marketing effort is better. They have a broker in New York, but they don't have one in Connecticut. It can be something as simple as that. There are any number of reasons why it couldn't happen, but you do have some research to do. You, you Congratulations. You picked up on something where you really want to drill down and find out uh, what's going on with this franchise and why that's happening. Great. Right. We'll, uh, we'll, we'll take one more. Um, Cliff, this is a topic that you touched on a little bit at the end. Um, is it better to buy a new franchise or buy an existing franchisee? Okay. The short answer is it depends. <laughs> it's the classic lawyer answer. Look at the seller's numbers. Have them show you their tax returns, their franchise royalty reports for the last three years. Is the franchise doing well? Is it generating a significant ODI? Um, generally speaking, buying an existing franchisee is less risky than, buy, than not setting up and operating a new territory. But like with buying any existing business, whether it's a standalone business or a franchise, you have to ask, why is the seller selling? Is it because they're getting ready to retire and they want to move down to Florida or California or Texas or someplace like that and, they, and the kids aren't interested in running it? Or is something going on in that community that's going to drive those numbers down? Do they know something that you don't know? That's why I'm so big on never buy a franchise in a territory that you don't know. If you live in that community, you know what's going on. If you're buying a territory halfway across the state, you don't know that a big competitor might be moving in in six months and it's going to wipe the place out or that it's going to become obsolete in some way. You don't know. If you don't know, if you don't know what's going on locally, it's very hard to analyze that. The seller is not obligated to tell you if stuff like that is going on. It's not like buying a house where if there's termites, they must by law disclose if there's termite damage. You know, it's totally buyer beware. Always have a good attorney and a good accountant to help you and don't buy too far from home, um, you know, and then look at the numbers. Make sure the numbers work. Are they generating a significant ODI? How long is it going to take you to recoup the purchase price? If the purchase price is one fifty thousand and the ODI is 50000 a year, you know it's going to take you three years to recoup uh, that, uh, that purchase price. Are you comfortable with that? Those are the questions you have to ask when you're buying an existing franchise. Thanks, Cliff. Uh, unfortunately, that's all the time we have uh, for questions today. Uh, just a reminder, the re uh, webinar was recorded and the materials will be available in the next 48 hours on the fairfieldcounty.score.org website and you can access them under on-demand workshops. Uh, next webinar will be two weeks from today, January 21st at noon, and the topic is social media marketing on a shoestring with Dory DiCarlo presenting. And again, um, if you would like free individual counseling, uh, you can uh, get that by requesting a mentor on our website. And uh, I'd also appreciate it if you would fill out your evaluations that'll be sent as you uh, sign off today. They're very helpful for us going forward. And on behalf of SCORE, I'd like to thank you for attending our live webinar and a special thank you to Cliff for presenting today and have a nice day, everyone.